Hey everybody, my name is Ted Forbes and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. I know this looks super casual today. I'm trying out a new camera um, and I will share that with you in just a second. But I actually wasn't going to do an episode today originally. Um, I'm actually out of town this weekend and I was going to take a week off. But at the last minute I decided, you know, I really want to wrap up some things we talked about uh, with shooting film. And the last three episodes we've done, if you have watched them, you'll know what we're talking about. If you haven't, you might want to go review. I'll put everything in the show notes, which you'll find in the description below or if for some reason you're watching this on an iPhone or an iPod or something like that, if you go to our website, you can find all the show notes there, which is theartofphotography.tv, theartofphotography.tv, and you'll uh, be able to catch up on everything there. So anyway, I wanted to do an episode just kind of last minute. I know it's very casual. Uh, just to wrap a few things up, um, some questions and some clarifications that people wanted. Just to recap, we did three episodes. Each one was dedicated to the various film types that are available today. Uh, we've got black and white film, true black and white. We've got C41, which is a color negative, and we have E6, which is a color positive. Um, and I hope that if nothing else, this has inspired you to grab a camera and get some film and shoot on this stuff. Um, I don't really do the film versus digital thing. I think they both have their place. I talk about digital a lot on this show. And we've just been talking about analog process or film process recently. And there's a real look to it and a real sense of fun that I don't get out of digital. Now, that's not to say digital is inferior. It has its place. It does things very wonderfully. But there's so many different looks and so many different things you can experiment with film that I think it's just really, a, you know, you treat yourself and, and shoot on it. I think you'd have a blast. Um, I do, and if you shoot on film, you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, you can get into it for, you know, very little money. Um, you know, even if you just have a point-and-shoot 35 millimeter camera, you know, use it. Get some film, get out there and shoot on it. Um, you can get an old manual speed or a manual um, mechanical 35 millimeter camera, like an old SLR or something like that, like a Pentax K1000, or we talked about some of the Nikon cameras. Uh, Canons are fine, whatever, just get out there and shoot. Um, that's the most important thing that you can possibly do. Um, if you're interested in 35 mil, those are some ways to go. If you want to shoot 120 millimeter or medium format, you get a completely different look, different negative size. This is 35 millimeter. You can see that the images on the medium format are much bigger, obviously. And you know, you can go a couple different ways with that and keep your costs down. If you buy an older TLR camera, Twin Lens Reflex, we've talked about those before, I will link them in the show notes. Um, you can get a really nice sharp image with those and you can get some great results. Uh, also, you could do something like a Holga or a Diana, which has a completely different look. It's still medium format, but it has a plastic lens. So the fun of shooting those is embracing those imperfections and learning how, what the camera kind of looks like and figuring out what situations you want to use that in. It can be a lot of fun. So anyway, just some things to keep in mind. You can even do 4x5. Um, 4x5 cameras go pretty inexpensive on the used market compared to what they used to be just because they're not really used in professional applications much these days, which is... You know, I think kind of sad, but uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun to do. Um, when it was also interesting because as we did these, I also did you know these ultimate film guides, which I'll link to as well. And we did basically each one of these guides was um, you know just to show you what all the available film types were for black and white C41 and E6 available today. And it's interesting because black and white seems to be doing pretty well. The selection is a little slim compared to what it was probably 10 years ago. Um, but there's still a lot of options and, and possibilities that you can do. Um, if you go to the other end, especially E6 with color film, film is starting to get a little bit scarce. With E6, really you're dealing with Fuji and they only make two different um, flavors of slide film, which is kind of sad, um, but it's the way it is. So, you know, if you're interested in shooting it, I would do it sooner than later, especially with color film. Uh, black and white, you're probably gonna be fine for a while. There's a huge enthusiast, hobbyist market of people like to do at home like me and uh, you know it'll still be around so anyway so get out there get your hands on some stuff and shoot um, I've also had people ask me about these these are film holders they're just plastic sheets you can get them from any camera store I'll put a link down there so you can find out where to get them um, film sleeves will keep your film clean it just simply goes in here it's like a big plastic envelope so you can still see what the pictures are but it keeps it clean do yourself a favor and get these if you're gonna shoot film they don't cost much and just get them if you're Getting your film done at a lab, in other words, you're not doing it yourself, you may not have this option at some place like a grocery store or a drugstore that just does the machine developing, but if you're doing a real lab, I always tell them not to cut the film. I prefer to cut it myself, and the reason is is because they make these in different formats. You can get, the, this, this sleeve actually has five images per row. Uh, some of them have six, and they can go different ways, and there's different configurations. And it can be a problem if they cut your film into groups of five and you have room for six and you can't get it all in here. And so anyway, so I prefer just to tell the lab not to cut the film. I just say, do not cut. I'll do that myself and they will return to you as such. And you might have told them medium as well. So anyway, just, uh, just some recap on that. Another thing I had was a question on pushing and pulling film. 
And just to reiterate what that is, is it means that you're going to shoot it at a different exposure than what is box speed. Now what is box speed? This is Ilford Delta 400 film. The box speed rates this at 400 ISO. If you have a mechanical camera, anyway, you can compensate for the exposure. If you're going to pull the film, you're going to reduce that exposure or you're going to shoot it at a different speed. Um, in, in, in the way film is measured is in stops, just like aperture and, and shutter speed as well. And so if you, if you cut the box speed in half, that's one stop. And if you cut that in half, it's two stops. So box speed is 400. If you're going to pull this one stop, it would be 200. If you're going to pull it two stops, that's half of that. That's down to 100. Um, it becomes much slower film and your contrast will decrease a little bit. Um, sometimes you can get a little bit wider dynamic range. It can be a nice effect, particularly if you're going to scan it and go into Photoshop or if you want to be able to manipulate contrast. Sometimes that's a handy thing to do. Um, other times you're in very low light and you need something faster than 400, let's say. You can push develop the film. And so if I'm going to push it, you double it for each stop. So you either cut it in half to pull or you double it to, uh, to push. And so I can push this one stop to 800 ISO. That becomes your exposure index and not box speed. Uh, or I could push that two stops. It would be one stop would be eight. Multiply that again by two. Two stops beyond yeah, that would be 16. So it goes 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, so on and so forth. That's what's happening. Remember that if you're going to change the, um, the exposure index that you're shooting at, you have to do it for the entire roll of film. It's just too difficult to, I mean, once it goes in the chemicals, it's in the chemicals. So if you're gonna push process a roll of film, you gotta push process the whole roll of film. You can't switch it back and forth between images. Sometimes it's a tough concept for people who have been used to shooting digital because on a digital camera, you can change your ISO for every image, it doesn't matter. Here you're dealing with a bunch of pictures that are on a roll and they come out looking like this. This is cut, but it's really long when they're all done. So they have to be shot at the same speed. Uh, coincidentally, that is known typically as exposure index or EI and neither here nor there. But just remember when you go to the film lab, you have to tell them to develop it accordingly. So if you've pulled this two stops, you need to tell the lab technician to pull it two stops. Some people have gotten some flack if you go to CVS or a grocery store with something with a machine. It's typically because they staffed it with somebody who knows how to operate the machine. Um, usually they're wearing a lab coat for some strange reason. I don't think they're actually touching any chemicals back there or beakers or anything, but anyway, whatever. Um, so anyway, always best to use a lab or process at home. You're going to get better results if you control them yourself. So anyway, I'll link up to some old episodes we've done um, in the show notes. We've done stuff on developing black and white at home done before. We've done pushing and pulling. I worked with Triax last summer and we did some stuff. If you're interested in any of these things, I'm going to link them all below. Um, so anyway, some cool stuff there. Um, so anyway, so that's it for film and I really hope that you guys are encouraged to experiment and do some stuff on your own. It can be a lot of fun. Also today, I want to, let's see, two more items here. I want to talk about some up and coming things because uh, I did some teasers a few weeks ago and I've been traveling a lot this summer and extremely busy. Um, I did some vlog episodes and the vlog episodes I don't put in the podcast feed necessarily. They are on YouTube, they're on the website. Um, but we did some vlog episodes on a trip that I did to New York to do a video interview and photo shoot with an artist named Jim Hodges. Um, and people have asked me about that, um, specifically about the business items on there. And this is probably worth doing a whole series of shows on and up and coming in the next couple months I want to hit those I want to talk about putting the other portfolios and websites and selecting your own work so we'll get into this as we go but just to clarify um, going to New York to film Jim Hodges uh, I have a day job and I work at an art museum here in Dallas and I am on staff to do this and so they sent me up there so People were asking, what do you charge for meeting time and, and to go up there and to rent equipment and all. And for me, it's different because I have a full-time job with these people and I'm in-house, um, so I don't charge for those things. But I can tell you, having freelanced before, that if you are freelancing, yes, you do have to um, incorporate all those things in. If you're renting equipment, typically you build that into your cost. Um, typically, if you have a lot of meetings and a lot of planning, you're going to build that into your cost as well. I feel very lucky to have had this job because... Uh, for me, it makes things possible that sometimes when you're freelancing, you just are not on the budget. So I feel like I can do a little more being in-house and everything's kind of taken care of. Um, so anyways, just to clarify that, that's what we're doing. Um, also to clarify that I have not given up on this project, um, at least with sharing it with you guys. We are going to be working on this. Now, the timetable on this is in June, we went up and shot 
the um, actually it was July. We went up and, and did all the filming in New York City. I rented all my equipment from Adorama, and I'll come back to that because I'm going to make another point about that in a minute. Um, we did the artist interviews, and I have about 10 hours of footage. We have a whole photo shoot that we did on the side, uh, which worked out really great. A lot of cool, candid shots. Um, this is all for an exhibition that's happening in the fall that opens in October. So the month of September, I'll be working a lot on that. So if you're interested in some of the behind the scenes and you want to see some of the project and you want to see some of the work that I'm doing for this and see the videos as well, uh, I will cover this in some vlog episodes coming up in September. I'm not traveling, so I'll have a little bit more time. Uh, typically, podcast episodes proper come out on Sundays, and I'll do the vlog during the week usually, so you might want to check around for that. Uh, but I will be covering a lot of the process. You'll get to see some of the work. I can't show it to you yet because we're really not there yet. Um, a lot of the video editing that's going down. And, and Jim Hodges is, is a really interesting artist. He's very thoughtful. He's very... Um, Oh, he has a lot of sage things he says a lot. It, it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot just artistically being around uh, this gentleman as well. He was amazing. So we are coming back to the Jim Hodges stuff. Um, and speaking of, one of the other things that I did when I was in New York, when we rented all the gear, I rented a GoPro camera, which I had not really used before and I've been very interested in. And the purpose of renting this was to do some behind-the-scenes footage to share probably on the show or wherever. And... I have to say that the GoPro worked great. Um, I was a little less than impressed with how it handled certain situations. And for what it is, it's just, you know. But I think the GoPro, for me, was just a little too expensive. I think, depending on the model you get, you gotta be prepared to spend, you know, 200, 300, $400 plus accessories. And they got some cool stuff. And, but namely, when we were in the artist studio, I'll show this with you. Um, it was a weird combination, I knew it would be, of lighting. We have window light coming in. I mean, it's a loft like this one, um, just a different shape. It's in an L shape, so around the corner then you have tungsten lighting, and it's kind of hard to work with. And one of the problems with the GoPro is it just the white balance, and it could have been the camera I was shooting on was real sticky. And so a lot of the footage was extra yellow or extra blue, which was a little bit unfortunate. Um, and anyway, I got back and I thought, wow, I want to do more behind the scenes stuff for the show. And so I was uh, searching around actually and found some reviews on this camera called the uh, Mobius Action Cam, which is this little thing right here. Um, it is very similar to the GoPro in a lot of respects, but it is a fraction of the cost. It's $80. And a lot of the footage that I was looking at on these uh, looked amazing. I was really impressed with what I saw. And I thought, well, for 80 bucks, I mean, gosh, I ended up buying two of them. I'm filming on one of them right now, and this is what it looks like. This is the second one. The reason I ended up ultimately buying these um, in the last couple weeks was another part of my job that I do is a lot of time-lapse footage. And when you work in an art museum, sometimes art is moved or sometimes there's these rather large-scale installations that are being set up with sculptures and, and things like that. And we like to do a lot of time-lapse footage to put those on the internet. And when you do time-lapse, we covered that a long time ago, uh, typically I use my SLRs. And you know, if you're using Nikon, you can use Sofa Build or something like that with the Mac, and you know, your, your Lightroom actually does it now too. And you can do all your capture that way. Um, I don't always like doing it that way because it puts a lot of accutations on the shutter, and I also have battery issues because sometimes these installations can take days, and the battery will wear out after you know an hour or two, maybe depending on how frequent you're shooting. And so it, that was one big bummer for me, is shutter accutations going way up on an SLR, um, and also uh, just the simple issue of battery. And so one of the things that really attracted me to the Mobius action cam is it actually has three modes that it shoots in. It has two video modes, and it has a still mode, which you can set to time lapse. This is a life changer. The quality on these is, I mean, it's a plastic lens, it's a small camera, but it's pretty impressive. Um, the lens is pretty wide, as you can see, you're looking through one right now, and it does fisheye just a little bit. Um, but, you know, if you're careful with placement and you have two of these and you can do different things, you can get some really interesting results. Um, I have these set to do time lapse at every five seconds, but you can increase that depending on you know, what you want with the software included. There's three buttons on the top. These two silver things are actually heat sinks. And uh, we'll talk about the, more about this camera later, but um, you turn the power on and you get a little colored light here. And... Uh, this one uh, better. Nope, there it is. So it's yellow right now, and if I hit the mode switch, it goes yellow, which is 1080p video at 30 frames a second. Um, if I go to the next mode, which is blue, this makes it 720p video at 60 frames a second. So if you want to do slow mo and stuff like that, that's a really great setting for that. And then the third mode is the still mode, which is red. 
And basically then you hit the shutter button, mount this on a tripod and you go away and you come back later and your only limitations are power and memory on your memory card. I put, this takes micro SD cards and I have a 32 gigabyte card in here and if you're shooting JPEGs for a time lapse you can get a lot of photos on here. And the other thing I did is I bought a USB battery pack which is basically a big brick, I don't have it in front of me right now, but it's a large brick and it puts a lot of charge on there. You can plug the USB cable in and it will power whatever device you have. And with these cameras, you can get hours and hours and hours out of it. So this completely solved my issue with, with time-lapse photography. And there's no shutter in here. It's just this quirky little spy cam. Uh, and you know you don't have to deal with, with wearing out your shutter on these things. If you wear out the camera, it was 80 bucks. That's not a huge deal. And I don't know what the quality is gonna be like in here. I don't have the best lighting in here in the studio right now. It's five o'clock and the sun starts going down and I have to shut shades and stuff. But Anyway, um, I'll post some footage of this in the coming weeks and you guys can see what's going on. Another cool thing I got, um, because the camera's so small, is you can get these, these funky little tripods off of, what's well, not tripods, a suction cup mount. I just got this off of Amazon, it was like $6. And basically you pop that up against any flat surface like glass or something like that and you can mount the camera to the top, just screws on. And so it's like a little tiny tripod and you can adjust that, leave it up. So really your, your footprint when you're shooting something like an art installation is very small and it's really cool. Um, I've gotten some really good results out of these and I will, um, I'll share those with you um, as we have some stuff available, it's all kind of new. So anyway, uh, guys, once again, I know this was a little bit loose of an episode. We've got a lot of cool stuff coming up in the fall. I know we're running a little long too. Uh, but I did want to just touch base today, recap on the film thing a little bit. If you got questions on anything, leave them in the comments. Um, I'll do my best to answer them. Send me an email, hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, whatever. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, see if we can keep the discussion going. Got some really cool stuff planned in the couple weeks for the fall. Again, I want to talk about portfolios, websites. We want to talk about maybe a few business items as well. And watch the vlog because I'm going to be sharing a lot of stuff. And maybe what we should do is put the vlog on iTunes too as a separate feed for those of you guys who like to watch it there. But I'll recap some of the Jim Hodges project that I did in New York this summer and uh, how the editing is going to go on that because it's a pretty monstrous project. And I'd be happy to diary some of that. Um, I've had a lot of interest in people who wanted to see what happened with the project and if we could see more behind the scenes. So I do have some footage that I have at the GoPro I rented. And uh, we'll get more into that in the coming weeks. So watch next week and I'll probably go ahead and get a couple of those going. So we'll see how this goes today. This is a really easy setup because literally I am just shooting on the Action Cam Mobius. I'm not even using a microphone today. This is all this camera. You're, I have two of them. You're watching through one of them and this is the other. So once again, folks, it's been the Art of Photography. Thanks for watching it and I will see you guys next time. Later.